You know, you try to do it bit by bit, and it's just better just yank it all at once. That could go so many ways. We're going to move on from there, though. Okay, so <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the panel, owning it, being a media mogul. I am your host, Demetria Lucas Doily. I am an author, I am a blogger, I am a vlogger, I am a relationship and dating expert, but most importantly, I am the host of today's wonderful panel. Thank you so much for all you wonderful, beautiful audience people for showing up today, the standing room only. I thank you very much. Um, there's a couple seats here and there. If you want to get in where you fit in, if you can make, raise your hand if you have an empty seat next to you. Just a couple. So folks, if you want to sit down, ladies in your heels, you're being very cute. If you need a seat, a couple folks got their hands up, make that happen. I'm trying to make way. everybody comfortable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to hope my screen stays on so I can read this to you in a prompt manner. And it's working. We got the bright screen. Here we go. In the age of fake news, alternative facts, and the Twitter fingers of our 45th president, Having a reliable and informative voice on social media is imperative to correct and resist the mainstream narrative. But before we get into that, the topic of today's panel, I want to bring to the stage the illustrious woman responsible for today's event, and personally, my favorite congresswoman, which I can say with some bias, as she represents my borough in Brooklyn. <laughs> Are you not Brooklyn? Thank you. Thank you. Y'all, we can represent anywhere, even away from home. It's good, we can yell it out proudly, because she will, trust me. <laughs> so I would like to bring to the stage my congresswoman, my favorite congresswoman, Yvette D. Clark. Thank you very much, Demetria. Is Brooklyn in the house? Yeah. Just thought I'd ask. Brooklyn's always in the house. A pleasant good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the 47th Annual Legislative Conference of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I am Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark and I proudly represent New York's 9th Congressional District, that's Brooklyn, New York. If you're looking to be the next media success, then you've come to the right panel. Today, you'll hear from a dynamic group of experts and media moguls to discuss content creation, ownership, entrepreneurship, and accountability. In other words, what does it take to be where they are today? The topic is especially important to me as the founder and co-chair of the U.S. House of Representatives Multicultural Media Caucus. I started the Multicultural Media Caucus to ensure that there was a congressional body dedicated to issues concerning diversity and inclusion in media, telecom, and tech. It is our sincere desire that the caucus serve as a vehicle to educate and inform conversation, advocacy, and policy prescriptions so that we have true and real culturally competent representation from the boardroom to the control room. And we've brought some of the best to this room today to continue that conversation. Before I hand the mic back to Demetria, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Each of us has an important role in moving our communities and our culture forward. We have a responsibility to be informed and educated how we protect our interests in a time of cultural appropriation. Can I hear an amen? amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? All right, I just want to make sure y'all are with me because it's really, really important that this generation get the breakthrough. For too long, we have been uh, at, the, at, the, at the core of the development of our civil society culturally, but have yet to really yield the benefit of the culture that we have imparted, of the ownership of the, of, the, of the substance of that culture, and it is more than time. I believe that, first of all, the millennial generation has got to get it right. And it is up to us who have experienced uh, the cultural appropriation, the exploitation, the lack of credit, 
you know, and, and all of the theft, let's just put it where it is, yeah. that took place uh, in generations gone by. So these folks are here, they're not having it. They understand uh, the, the construct in which we are operating and we'll be sharing that with you today. It is vitally important that we create the content that we want to see, content that reflects who we truly are, our authentic being, our authentic expressions, and that we own, hello, own our content. I say ownership because I know all of you in this room at some point in your life were told, get a good education and get a job. I'm telling you, get a good education and own the corporation. Okay? Remember that. Our next group of experts will provide you with great advice to help move all of you and all of us in the right direction. So thank you so much for coming out today. I want to thank our panelists for sharing your expertise and your talent with this group of individuals seeking and thirsting for knowledge. And uh, Demetria, back to you, my sister. I'm so very excited about what we have coming up. Um, before our panel begins, we have a very special treat. We have a mobile talk with Angela Yee from The Breakfast Club. How many of us listen to, like, everybody? Okay. So she is a woman who needs no introduction, but I will introduce her as it's the proper thing to do. Angela Yee is one third of the very popular and nationally syndicated morning show, The Breakfast Club, along with DJ Envy and Charlemagne the God. You started her radio career at Sirius in 2005 as the co-host for the Cypher Sounds Effect, when Cypher left Sirius in July 2008, Yee took over the hosting duties full time, and the show was renamed The Shade 45 Morning Show, starring Angela Yee. Yeah. In December 2010, Yee left Shade 45 and began hosting The Breakfast Club on Power 105.1, which bills itself as the world's most dangerous morning show, with very good reason. Yeah. The Breakfast Club show debuted, excuse me, The Breakfast Club show debuted on Revolt, on March 31st, 2014. Now, if you know anything about Angela Yee, you know that is a very, very abbreviated version of her biography, and we're gonna get into the rest of that when I bring her to the stage for a one-on-one -on -one interview. Angela Yee, come on up. Check, check, everybody can hear? Yeah. That's so radio of you. <laughs> so we gotta make sure the mic sounds right. So Angela, I'm super excited to be on the stage with you today. Like we met, I don't even know what year it was. There was a luncheon somewhere, like there was a shoe store in Harlem and I didn't have a car in New York and I had to make it back to Brooklyn and Harlem to Brooklyn is like the train equivalent of going from like Philly to New York. <laughs> like literally, it's 90 minutes. Um, and you offered to give me a ride. Right. And I was like, oh, she's so sweet. And you know, this girl, Angela Yee, and I mentioned to one of my friends, that, like, oh, how did you get home so quickly? Oh, this girl, Angela Yee, gave me a ride. And they were like, oh my God, Angela Yee? Angela Yee gave you a ride? And I was like, am I missing something? <laughs> so like, I knew your voice, but I didn't know your name. Right. And that was, I don't even know what year that was. But you like, probably were like 14. Yeah, let's go with that, let's go with that. But since that time, you've become like, the face, the name, you had billboards, you own businesses, like you do so much. And so my first question is, how do you balance it all? Well, one thing I always say, because it is true, I do do a lot, like we have the morning show, I get up at four o'clock every single morning, and what I did today was I left work, came straight to DC because I wanted to make sure I was here for this. Thank you to Congresswoman Yvette Clark for having me. And when I leave here, I'm going straight to the airport and we have the Vegas uh, iHeartRadio Music Festival. So yes, so I'm leaving here to go do that. But I, it was really important for me to be here. It's my first time at the Congressional Black Caucus and I'm excited because Demetri and I have known each other for years. So I love the fact that I'm here. So thank you guys so much for making this successful. But one thing I say is that I just don't think about it. 
Sometimes you think too hard, like, oh, I have to do this, this, and you list everything you have to do in a day. I just do it. I set alarms in my phone for everything. So if I have a conference call at 1 o'clock, I set an alarm for 12.57 so that I don't, because I'll forget something. If you call me and tell me in five minutes you have to do, I'll forget two minutes later. So I set alarms for everything in my phone. It's really important for me to be organized because it is a lot of different things that I have to do. And I also think your attitude is important. Instead of me feeling like, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that, I say, I'm so grateful that today's gonna be a great day and I have the opportunity to come and do these things because it is a blessing. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, I would like to know, just like, let's go back to the beginning of your career. How did you find your voice in the sense that you're like, you know what, I have something to say and I wanna say it to a wide audience and I think people will actually listen to me. I think a lot of us don't know what we wanna do when we first get started. I'm from Brooklyn also, so that's why this was particularly important for me. But when I went, I went to high school in Brooklyn and then I went to college, I went to Wesleyan in Middletown, Connecticut. I was an English major and ever since I was in kindergarten, I said, I'm going to be a writer when I get older. I always thought that. I wrote my first poem when I was in first grade. I still know it. And <laughs> but things change. How many people in here are really doing what they thought they would be doing when they were in high school or in college? Okay, we know you are. <laughs> but it's, you know, the fact of the matter is that we get so influenced by different things that we do. I had one of my interns ask me, what's important about college? Because so many people told her, you don't need to go to college, you need real life experience. But one thing that I did learn from going to college was I got some great relationships. Not only did I take classes and things that I never anticipated or thought I would be interested in, but there's people to this day that still help me out. So, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> how did you know your voice was, how did you know to use your voice? <laughs> so I will say this, like ever, ever since I was young, I always have been really outgoing and had a lot of friends. And it's been a process. I think we learn so much, even from our mistakes. I've made a lot of mistakes growing up, and I think that mistakes are really just one of the strongest ways that you can shape yourself. I look at mistakes as, okay, I learned something from this, and I'll never do this again. Now I know how to proceed moving forward. And it's really important to own up to whatever your mistakes are and move forward and improve. And that's one way that I've really learned my voice, like just learning from those things and not, not letting it destroy you or make you feel like I can never do this again. It's just so important for you to say, okay, this was a blessing because while this might have been tragic at the time, later on in life, I've learned a huge lesson and thank God I learned it when I did. Awesome. When did you realize that your voice held a little more weight than others? And I'll say this, like from coming from a blogging background, you know, like I was blogging to my friends, my family, and then the audience would grow bit by bit by bit. And then I remember I published a piece, and then other magazines or, or sites or blogs started talking about what I was writing about. And I was like, wait, I'm just a girl typing on her Blackberry. When did my voice start carrying? She went viral. Life? Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but like, but when did you realize, like, okay, it's not just you know me talking to like you know a hundred people, but it's like a thousand or a million. I think that when I first started working at Sirius, and I'm gonna be honest, like I didn't go to school to do radio. So me getting that job was nerve wracking for me. And when I first started, I didn't tell anybody that I had that job. I was like, it's a secret. And every now and then somebody would be like, I think I heard you on the radio. Cause I have a very distinctive voice. You hate it or you love it. But I do have a very distinctive voice. And so I would be like, yes, that's me. But I didn't want to advertise it because I felt like, number one, it was a probationary period. So if I got let go after two weeks, <laughs> really embarrassing. But the second part was I wanted to get better before I really advertised that I was there. It was like boot camp because you're really on the radio every single morning. So for me, I think I realized it. We did this interview with Jay-Z. And that was like my first big, big interview at Sirius. I was co-host with Cypher Sounds. They weren't sure exactly what was going to happen. If they were going to keep me, it was just, okay, I wasn't getting paid, but I was still going every single day like I was getting paid. And I was going to the bathroom, and I saw Jay-Z, he was going to the men's, I was going to the women's, and he's like, what are you doing here? I said, I'm about to interview you. <laughs> and he said, can I, no, I'm not gonna curse. He said, Angela, don't F this up. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. So I went in the interview, it was him, it was Memphis Bleak, and it was young Chris. And we did the interview, and it was such a great interview that afterward, my boss was like, oh yeah, you're hired right now. That's how good the interview was. 
and people ended up putting it, Clinton Sparks put it on a mixtape. It was like a really big deal. And this was before Twitter, before all of that, before Instagram. So that's when I was like, wow, this is a big deal. People who never paid attention to me, all of a sudden knew who I was, and that was just the power of doing a great interview. Awesome. So you're doing hip hop radio, you're interviewing mega stars, and it's a male dominated field. How do you operate as a woman and keep your integrity and keep your voice so strong in that arena? I think fortunately for me, I have a really strong foundation. Before I did radio, I worked doing marketing and branding. So when I started doing radio, a lot of people already knew me behind the scenes. And that was important to me because people could vouch for me. So even if sometimes things go left, at least you know you have the support of people that know you personally. It's really hard when people don't know you personally. Just think about all the people you follow on Instagram who you don't know and you see a story and you make assumptions. But fortunately, fortunately for me behind the scenes, like Demetria could be like, oh, Angela would never do that because I've met her and she's not that type of person. She gave me a ride and she didn't know me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really important to represent yourself well, no matter who's watching. It's really important if you're talking to somebody, the CEO of a company or somebody that works in the mirror room, it doesn't matter who that person is, treat people really well. There's no reason not to. If you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. And I think that foundation of me just being a genuine person and who I am has always helped me out so much that I felt very confident in knowing that even if this doesn't work out, I know I have any other opportunity that I want because I have laid down a really, really solid foundation for myself. How do you, so you mentioned social media and it's made our professional lives so much different. So we're very public lives, we have, we're very opinionated, we're very out there. And early on in our careers, if you said something people didn't like, somebody wrote about it in a newspaper or a magazine or a blog, but now they come on your Instagram page by like the hundreds of thousands, or you know they're adding you on Twitter or Facebook. How do you deal in the middle of a media storm? I black people. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a gift and a curse. The fact of the matter is that social media is just how you decide to use it. I have people that say negative things to me all the time, and I have people that say positive things. I think it's a lot harder for younger people now because I've managed to, just the whole way that I have developed into who I am, it was a whole entire upward trajectory. So it wasn't like all of a sudden everybody knows who I am. It was a process. I've been doing radio for 13 years. So I've been able to take those steps and build up a tougher skin. It's a lot harder for a high school or a middle school kid that goes on social media and posts something and then people can be so negative or sends a picture out and someone else posts a picture of them that they didn't intend. That's a lot harder. I feel like for me, I have managed to not have to deal with that error earlier because you use Twitter. I remember you using Twitter a lot just as far as you giving advice to people. Yeah. But that was a great positive way to use it because you were using it in a positive form. Some people go on there like determined to try to ruin your day. Yeah. And you have to realize that for people that do that, that's more of a reflection of how they feel about themselves. I'm not a negative person, so I don't think negative thoughts about other people. I would never go on somebody's page and say something crazy and something rude and something mean. I just don't think like that, but there are people who do, and I think those people are people who are not really confident in themselves. So I always look at it like, it's not me, it's you. <laughs> You know, I listen to The Breakfast Club all the time. I'm riding around or I'm on the treadmill, and I feel like there are no boundaries. <laughs> like, you'll have a conversation about anything that people are talking about. Like, if it's interesting to the audience, like, you'll take it on. Do you have boundaries? And if so, what are they? Well, we do have some FCC boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> Pesky FCC. <laughs> So there are boundaries, but you're right. I mean, we definitely push those boundaries. I think that I probably, out of the three of us, might be the one person that I'm always like the extra nice person, but that's really just how I am in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, I always give people the benefit of the doubt. Like you hear me now saying somebody says something crazy to you. I look at it like, man, I feel so bad for them. They must be going through something. And Charlamagne might look at it like, no. Nah. <laughs> right, <laughs> and they'll go in on you. We're just very different in how we approach things. But the fact of the matter is that yes, we have gotten in trouble for certain things that have happened. But I think that in general, we have our own self boundaries that we're like, okay, I can't take it that far. 
the, like for me, I don't even think to take it that far because that's just not my style. And that's just not how I am as a person. But I think for some people, people do try to push things to the limit in general. Like they think you get attention being negative. If you look at a lot of things on TV and people, you look at the Cash Me Outside girl, who now has a record deal from being really negative. And, and people think that you get rewarded for just negative things. And it does happen on reality. In general, people go viral for just awful things. So sometimes people think that's a real quick way to just get fame. And they don't understand that later on in life, it's embarrassing. Like when you have kids and you have to try to explain what happened or you're trying to get an endorsement situation or you really want to build a career, was it worth it? Was it worth it? That's the question we should all ask is in terms of being on social media. Sometimes we tweet and post in anger or shade or pettiness. Right. Like, you know, was it worth it? Um, sorry, I scrolled up too far. What responsibility do you feel being a woman in radio or a woman in color in radio, of color in radio? It is a fine balance of different things because I do support all women being able to do whatever they want to do as far as with their body. There's people that do things that I would never do, but I really try hard not to be judgmental about it. And so while it might be, and I do feel like sometimes we're so liberal as far as People look at me like I'm really conservative. I never looked at myself that way, but it's a lot of things about the way I dress, the way I carry myself, that I'm really not as free as some people are, but I don't judge what other people do. If what you're doing makes you happy, you know, I wish that people could be happier with themselves and they don't feel like they have to do certain things. I wish that people didn't feel like they had to alter their pictures and, you know, bring snatch the waist in and get rid of those. Like, why can't we just be who we are? But I do feel like there's this standard of people where you post a picture and you're checking it and refreshing and refreshing every few seconds to see how many likes you get to see who says what in the comments. And I remember being at a party and one of my friends, I guess one of the blogs posted a picture of her and people were saying negative things. It ruined her whole night. And I would hate for social media to ruin your night. Outside of, because you're known for the Breakfast Club, you know, like you've got your billboard all over the place and you're syndicated, you know, you're a very big deal. Thank you. But you also, you own, you own a yogurt? Oh, I own a juice bar in Brooklyn, okay. and okay. it's in bed -Stuy. And that was a really big deal for me. Just, I teamed up with Styles P, who has three other ones. It's called Juices for Life. He has two, um, three of them in Yonkers and in the Bronx. And I'm from Brooklyn, I live in Bed-Stuy now, I'm from Flatbush. But what I did was, I just felt like every single morning people ask me, how do you get up so early and how are you able to have energy throughout the day? And that reason is I drink green tea every morning and I juice every morning. It's hard for me to eat like a meal because then I get exhausted. And I remember Emma used to come in every day and have like two donuts and a, yeah, disgusting, and a soda. <laughs> And I was like, and then he would have like a bad attitude around nine o'clock. <laughs> and I was like, you have to stop eating donuts every morning and drinking soda. That's why you act so nasty. And I had him start, you know, juicing. I, first I had him doing the green tea and I didn't tell him that it's gonna make him go to the bathroom. And he was like, why do I have to keep going to the bathroom? But the fact of the matter is that things like that are so healthy and we didn't have a juice bar in Brooklyn. So I would come home, or it would be the weekend, and I was like, man, I really wish I could get like some kale, some spinach, green apples, bananas, ginger, whatever. And there was no place for me to go get it. So I felt like, let's make it cool to have a juice bar where the kids can come, people in the neighborhood can come, the gentrified people can come. <laughs> but everybody comes together, the police officers, everyone just come and get your juice. And that was my vision. And I went to Styles P's Juice Bar in Yonkers, and I loved the way that, like, that day I saw, like, I mean, a butterfly from Love and Hip Hop, and then I saw some police officers come in, and then I just saw all kinds of people in there, and I loved the way that it brings the community together in a healthy, positive way, and I was like, I would love to do that in Brooklyn. So I went, and I, he had a video shoot. I asked his DJ, I said, I need to talk to Styles P. He's like, man, he's really hard to get a hold of. So he told me when he had a video shoot, and I popped up, and I was like, you know, I really want to talk to you about this juice bar. And he thought it was a great idea because we have a platform. And when you have a platform, you, that's the best time to try to do something. Mm -hmm. I don't want to waste what I have right now as far as my interest that I have outside of the Breakfast Club. That can only help whatever else it is that I want to do. So because I have a platform, I was like, this is the time for me to be able to do this. It wasn't really about 
I'm going to make you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars opening a juice bar. But what it does do is make me feel great when I, it's in my neighborhood. And when I see people from the neighborhood, everybody knows me. People are like, thank you so much for putting this juice bar here. When I see people come in and say, I had high blood pressure, and now my blood pressure is normal because I've been coming here every day. I heard you talk about the juice bar. One guy's like, I lost 30 pounds. Look at you. His skin, but things like that. <laughs> It makes such a big deal. When I see little kids come in, like the other day this kid came in and he's four years old, his mom gave him a juice and he drank it and she was like, I cannot even get him to eat vegetables. <laughs> and he loved it, but things like that make such a big difference. Just starting those habits earlier for kids and you know, and it's a really nice taste. We got a big teddy bear, we have a huge oversized Connect 4, so the kids come in here, they're playing Connect 4, we have a flat screen TV, all of that just because I want people to feel like this is yours. Come in here, hang out. We have Wi-Fi for you. Have a meeting here if you need to. Come use the backyard. Stay for four hours. Hang out with us. When we close, you gotta go. But <laughs> yo, this juice bar sounds like like the club slash like the office slash like like a WeWork. Listen, I made the bathroom. It's all gold and black. It's like ridiculous. But you know, people say the bathroom is the most. You can t judge a restaurant by the bathroom. And I have chandeliers. Like, I made a big deal out of just making this place just look beautiful because I want us to be proud. Yeah, yeah. So now I want to go to your juice bar. We're going to have to drive to Brooklyn after this panel. I'm ashamed of you for not having been there already. I think, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Now she's like, but I thought she was my friend. No more rides for you. <laughs> I mean, I got a truck now. I came up too, Angela. In case you Uber. <laughs> So we're running, we're getting down to my last questions because I'm going to open it up to the audience. So if you have questions, you can line up at the microphone right here. We're going to take three or four before Angela has to fly back to fly to Vegas because mm -hmm. she's on the road. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self? I would say that I wish that when I had a big chunk of money, I would have bought a house back then. Mm. <laughs> Girl, girl. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something really stupid that I did. It's so embarrassing, I don't even say it. But um, I remember working for Wu-Tang. That was my first job out of college. And I had got like $20,000. That was a lot of money for me at that time. And I was like, I'm gonna buy a car. <laughs> so my brother was like, oh, I know this guy. He's a car dealer. He's gonna get the car for you really cheap. I don't know what happened to this guy. I Googled him the other day, apparently he's a scammer. But I didn't get my car, but if I could go back in time and know that I could have, especially back then, bought a, you know, put some money down on a house instead of trying to buy a car, that was like the dumbest thing. And I didn't learn that, and I always feel like in school, we don't learn about finances the way we should. We learn algebra, we learn geometry, we learn trigonometry. But why don't we learn about the stock market? Why don't we learn about how to get a mortgage? Why don't we learn about interest rates? And so I just wish that I would have known more about that because I feel like I could have been really popping right now right. if I would have taken that money and did something smarter with it. And so if I could tell my younger self something, it would be that when you made that much money, do something useful with it. Invest it. Right. Invest it. Allow your money to make more money, which is the purpose of money. Um, hold on, was this back when they were like selling brownstones for a dollar? Remember that? That was in Harlem. That was Harlem. I feel like that was in Harlem. I don't know. I, I like brownstones. But I had a dollar. But <laughs> I had a dollar. <laughs> but you know, I mean, people were really buying brownstones in Best Eye in Brooklyn really cheap. I probably could have took that $20,000 and put it down and got a brownstone for $100,000 and the interest rates were low. We would have been neighbors. But yes. I would have came over with kale. Oh. Like. <laughs> <laughs> What advice would you give to someone who, you know, who looks at your career, a man or a woman, and says, I want to be the next Angela Yee? I would say that there is no shortcut. I know a lot of people want success really quickly, but it does take a lot of work. Like, people don't understand what goes on behind the scenes. Demetria, I know you put in a lot of work. Over. People might have seen you on Bless with Hills. Really? You didn't mention that? Really? I have. <laughs> that was my show, okay? I was watching you on there. Thank you. But people might see that and think, where did she come from? Okay, this is so quick. But what people have to realize is that it is a lot of work. It's a lot about building relationships and taking advantage of situations and just really knowing that when you are first trying to make it, it's not all about how much money you're getting paid. It's about how much experience am I getting because that's a better investment when you're first getting started so that later on you can demand what you are worth. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Thank you, Angela, for being so candid. Oh, if you can come to the microphone, just because we're doing a live feed, so I want to make sure everyone is heard. 
And as you line up quietly, thank you. And we can only take like five questions. How, how hard what is your time is it? It's like, like three questions. Oh yeah, we have time. We got time? Okay, we can just take questions until Angela gotta go. So yes and ma'am. Say check, check, once. Check, check. There, there we go. go. We work. That always works. Cooking with butter. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for being here and sharing your experience. It means a lot. I'm from Eastern Europe. I'm from Moldova. I was a journalist there. So I watch you on uh, Breakfast Club all the time on YouTube. Thank you to you for covering such good questions because usually I have a lot of questions and now I'm kind of at a loss. I'm <laughs> also a journalist. I'm like trying to do my job. <laughs> I'd like to say, um, you know, we see you now as a successful person, um, but maybe throughout your career, you had moments of self-doubt. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with that? And especially now as millennials, you know, there's always um, an aspect where we are comparing ourselves with other people, either we want it or not. Um, maybe some advice on this and you know, how does it just kind of survive in this fast-paced social media environment? Thank Good you. Good question, thank you. I always think we should never compare ourselves to other people because we don't know what's really going on. There's people that we look at that, are, that we think are successful and we don't know what financial hardships we're, they're having, we don't know what emotional hardships they're having and we're always surprised when we find out, we're like, that person looked like they was doing so well and then come to find out, oh, they were suffering with depression. You don't know what anybody else is going through, so I've never compared myself to anyone. There's people that I feel like I have looked at and said, I love what they're doing, but I've never said, I wanna do what they're doing. I've never compared myself, so I think it's really important to not do that, because you always wanna do whatever it is. Like, I, I don't listen to other radio shows and say, okay, I wanna be influenced by that. I just think about what interests me and what I love to do, and then I try to pursue that goal. And never stop learning. I think that's important too. Just because you're doing something and you're successful at it, that doesn't mean you should ever stop. Like, figure out how can I take this to the next level? What else can I do that supports this? What makes me happy? And pursue that. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you so much, because you've been so transparent and so informative. And thank you for your wonderful questions as well. Um, I just want to ask, what's one of the most simple and impactful things we can do for our brand just every day as far as social media is concerned? I feel like I get bombarded with so many ideas. You should be posting every two hours. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. Um, live feed, Facebook, Instagram, and Snap all at the same time. Let's go. I'm just like, okay. <laughs> like, I'm really trying. Sometimes I'm like, I'm not authentic right now. Like, I don't want to pull. Like, I don't feel like, you know, so like, what's the simple takeaway that we can do consistently, every day, daily operation to promote ourselves, to strengthen our brand, etc. I would say one thing you can do, and you said consistency, but I, I was going to say be consistent. The other thing I would say is reach out to somebody every day. Pick somebody different to reach out to that you can say, hey, I've been watching what you're doing, and I just want to say it means so much when sometimes people aren't understanding if their message is reaching someone or when other people are saying negative things, to have somebody reach out and just say something positive and say something, I've been watching what you're doing, I really love the fact that you did this, and send something personal. Things like that mean so much, and you send 100 and it, all it takes is one person to write you back that can really help you out, you never know how it can happen. So every day, pick somebody to reach out to, somebody different, and say something positive to, and you know, study what they're doing. Awesome. Thank you so much. You know, I think most people would be surprised how often people who are doing well don't get compliments right. or don't get support. People think they're like, oh, she's doing great. She's on TV, she's on the radio. And they're like, oh, she must be fine. And it's like, well, you have good days and bad days like everyone else. And I would also add this, everyone checks their DMs. Like, no matter how famous <laughs> you are, like, my really famous A-list friends are like still in their Instagram. Unless you're DMs. Beyonce, I don't think she checks them. No, Beyonce, well, she's beyond us. You know, I mean, like, mere mortals still check their, their DMs, yeah. Do we have any more questions from the audience? <laughs> hey, how you doing? Um, I'm Thomas. I'm a producer for Great Day Washington here in D.C. Um, do you have a concerted like strategy when it comes to social media, or do you kind of just kind of go with the flow? Um, I always find that I, I kind of have a hard time thinking. Well, just like the other young lady said, how often should I tweet or should I Instagram, or um, should I like for you? Do you like um, 
put your like talk about your juice bar a lot? Do you say like okay, eighty percent of my tweets is going to be what we talked about on the show today? I'm just kind of curious about. That. I'm definitely not that strategic, <laughs> but I do always try to keep it positive. Like I'll, you'll never see me on there going back and forth with somebody having a Twitter fight. I'll block you before if you say something and I feel really the urge to go in on you. I'd rather just block it than have to do that and. I don't want to give people like that satisfaction of knowing you got under my skin and now I have to reply to you. So what I try to do is I always, I tweet a lot more in the morning than I do any other time during my show. Because our show is so interactive, so if there's topics that we have, I'll put that up. I try to retweet people that have things to say that I know will appreciate that because it means a lot to people that listen to the show if you retweet them or, or respond to them. So I try to make sure that I do those things because I know you know, little things like that. If somebody sends me a message, I do an advice segment called Ask Ye. And so sometimes people send me messages that I'm like, I need to reach out to this person personally because they're really going through something. Those little things can really help a person way more than you could possibly imagine. So things like that I do. And I never really, I would never post that on my social media. So I really try to keep my social media to things that are like, you know, I post recipes for the juices that we do at the juice bar. I post things that I think, like, you know, we had the figure skaters of Harlem come to the show, and I had them. Just certain things I post that I think people would like to see and are really positive, but I stray away from <coughs> doing anything that I think is nasty or negative. Thank you. See, you're so much better than me, because, like, I'm, I'm, again, I'm a life coach, so I'm very honest about I'm still working on my petty. <laughs> like, it's in me. I'm trying to get it out, but we got a ways to go. We progress very far. But I think now what stops me is knowing that if I respond to certain things, it has the possibility of ending up on a blog. Right. So the story she isn't like clap back. you cursing me out, it's me clap backing to you. And, and like, now you brought my attention to something exactly. that you really don't want somebody to see. So yeah, yeah. I 100% agree with that. It's like the brands I work with just look at the pictures, they're not like all up in the comments, but it's like now I respond, now it's on the shade room, now it's like a thing. As opposed to... I mean, I know people who could have gotten endorsement situations and they wrote something on Instagram or Twitter that ruined that for them. So I always keep that in mind. I'd be like, I'm out here getting this money. Yeah, don't, mess up, don't <laughs> mess up the church's money. Don't mess up the church's money. Do we have any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Come on up. Come join us. Let's have a chat. Your hair is wonderful. Thank you. You're awesome. <laughs> Greetings. I'm Greetings. Ju. Um, I have a question for both of you. When building your brand and kind of getting your um, own personal brand off the ground, how did you go about identifying your targeted audience? Okay. I like to, I, I feel like I've been talking to Yes, because you're the guest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a turn of change up for you, isn't it? I yeah, know it is. Uh, so for my targeted audience, all right, so I'm going to be honest. At, um, at iHeart, right, as, I think like for me as an individual and me as far as the Breakfast Club, it's two different things because I know I have my own life outside of there and you know the way that I represent myself. And on the radio, I'm very authentic, but it's also we only have a certain amount of time to express who we are. It's quick, it's me and two guys. I'm always battling with them. <laughs> so I think you know one of the main things for me is just, um, I guess I read people's comments and I can tell like, I have a certain thing that people expect. They know that Angela is the person that they can trust. I don't even endorse products that I don't feel like I can believe in. So they might have asked me, oh, can you do this e-cigarette campaign? I'm like, no, because I would never encourage anybody to smoke e-cigarettes. And so there's certain things that I feel like I can't do that because it's not authentic to who I am. Anything that feels like organic to me that I can say, okay, I tried this product and I, I think you should try it too. Or, you know, I eat here, I think you should eat here too. I shop here, I think you should shop here too. Those are the things that I like to do. I never want to do something that I don't believe in. I never want to tell somebody to try a product and do something that I don't, I haven't tried and that I couldn't in my own right mind represent. So for me, my targeted audience is, I think sometimes we don't want to think about that too much. I think the main thing is just being authentic and being who you are, and people that are drawn to that will be drawn to that. And iHeart is really, I think, very, very supportive of who we are and what we do. Anything that I've done outside of there, that you know, the juice bar, they're like, let's figure out ways for you to bring more people to the juice bar and make money. When there's artists that we really like and support, iHeart has all these different programs that allow us to support. Like, you see, you guys see how Cardi B is blowing up? and how much stuff that we have you know, done for her and had her on the show and she's gonna be doing Powerhouse and all of that. 
But I just feel like anything that we truly honestly feel like, okay, I'm behind this, I support this, that's who we are. I don't think about, okay, who's listening to this and how will it affect them? I think more of, this is who I am and this is how I want to represent myself. So whoever likes it, likes it. And if you don't, we can't please everybody. For me, it was, um, it was slightly different. Um, I noticed a void in the type of, I guess the stories about black women that were being told. I started my blog in 2007 and, and Sex in the City was still on the air. And it was one of my favorite shows. But it always bothered me that there was no black woman on a show that was based in New York City. And I thought about the way that relationships were portrayed on that show. Like dating and relationships, it was fun. It was, you know, like you had a bad date and then like you recovered or you had a bad relationship and you took a chance to, to cry it out and then you were back in the game. And it didn't seem like the end of the world and so daunting as it was when you talked about black women in dating or black women in relationships. And I thought that my friends' experiences with dating were much closer to Sex in the City than they were to like, I don't know, like waiting to exhale, end of the world, like I'm gonna hold my breath until I die if a man doesn't come. Um, and I wanted to tell that story. And so I was complaining to anyone who listened about like, where are the stories about black women that I want to see? Where are the stories about this? Where are the stories about that? And finally, a very, very good friend was like, well, you're a writer, so why don't you just write? Right. So I wrote to fill a void, and I specifically wanted to speak to women who looked like me. Um, so I really also wanted to get the voices out of my head because I have like ideas about, you know, whatever. That's, that's a writer's it's therapeutic. It's, so you, it's therapeutic. Um, but I had a lot of ideas. I wanted to get them out, and that's why I wrote. And so the audience just sort of came from that. Yeah. And that was you being authentic and like who you were. Exactly. Look at you interviewing. Um, but I'm getting the wrap it up sign from, from the good folks in the corner. So thank you very much, Angela, for gracing the stage with your presence, gracing thank us you. with your presence. Thank you, Demetria, and thank you to um, Congresswoman Yvette Clark. Thank you so much for having me here today. And thank you, everybody, who came and cared. Can you guys invite me next year, too, please? that from the stage. She was like, that's a fourth yes, but you killed it, so thank you. I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to uh, introduce to some and present to others uh, a sister who is uh, really near and dear to me. She's a congresswoman from the state of Alabama, uh, Te Congresswoman Terry Sewell, the only black woman in their delegation and the only Democrat in their delegation. We're, we're closest in, 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 in age in, in the CBC, so that's a special sister right there. And we both have amazing mothers. And we both have amazing mothers. <laughs> out with Congresswoman Clark because you never know who's going to show up. It's always VIPs and always unexpected. So for the next bit of our presentation, we have an amazing, amazing panel. I'm very excited. We're going to pick the brains of a few media moguls and experts who will discuss the importance of content creation, ownership, entrepreneurship, and accountability. They will engage in a passionate and thoughtful discussion on how to find your voice, create engaging content, and most important, how to own your own business. So, coming to the stage, are you ready? Are you, this we're black, we do a call and response thing, so are you ready? Yeah. Thank you, black folk. And others, I don't wanna leave nobody out, nobody out, no CBC, but everybody's welcome. Um, so first we have Cheryl Grace, she's the Senior Vice President, U.S. Strategic Community Alliances and Consumer Engagement at Nielsen. We have John Murray, he is one of my personal friends, but more importantly, he is a TV host, pop culture expert, and editor of AlwaysAList.com. We have April Rain, she's a social media activist and the creator of the viral hashtag, OscarSoWhite. And we have James McMillan. He's the managing partner of James E. McMillan, PC, and the founder of GothamCityEsquire.com. 
And last but not least, we have Christopher Gray. He is the founder and chief, chief executive officer. Sorry, we're gonna get this right. One second. He is the founder and chief executive officer of Scully. Did I pronounce that? Scully. Someday I'm gonna get it right. So thank you, panel. I'm very excited to have you here. And should I sit, stand? Let's sit. No, stand. Stand? Stand. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so my heels, I have like the shoals in the front of my shoes, so we will be okay today. So my first question is for you, John Murray, and I would like to know, since it's the title of today's panel, what does it mean to be a media mogul? Uh, being a media mogul is somebody who can be a successful entrepreneur uh, through ownership, a key position, or uh, great brand recognition uh, with a media brand or entity. Um, you know, as we move into contemporary times, um, you know, being a media entity isn't just the traditional aspects of newspapers, radio, television, um, but because of the digital landscape, it's, it's, you know, it could be a digital entity uh, which has so many subsections. So I think having ownership and, and great success as an entrepreneur in media or having a key position in a, an existing media infrastructure, if you don't own it, would be being a media mogul. Thank you. April, I have a question for you. You created the hashtag Oscar's So White, and how many people in here know Oscar's So White? Everyone knows what it is. How many people use it? How many people know that that's directly, hey you. How many people know that it's directly responsible for the changes that happened in the Oscar? Look, look at this informed group of people, I love y'all. April, when you, when you used that hashtag, did you have any expectations that it was going to go viral, much less make so much, make changes in the, the very thing that you were critiquing? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't think that um, you ever know when a hashtag is going to go viral. You can attempt it. Um, you know, many have tried, few have succeeded. Um, I created Oscar So White very organically. I was being sarcastic in my family room when I was watching the Oscar nominations on TV that morning and category after category, both in front of and behind the camera, it was an incredibly homogenous group. And what I mean is there weren't any active, actively and open LGBTQIA folks. There weren't any people of color. There weren't any people with disabilities. It was just a whole bunch of white folks, to be very honest. And based on what we see, based on this room, the, who the moviegoers are, we need to have more inclusion with respect. We need to be able to see ourselves on screen. So the, the goal is when you create a hashtag or when you're attempting a campaign of any kind, or even when you're not attempting one and it just sort of happens, you've got to own that moment. You've got to decide if you are going to be responsible for the message that you are now curating. So in the five weeks from middle January of 2015, to Oscars night, which was middle February, um, about five weeks, Oscar So White, the hashtag was used over 600,000 times wow. all over the world. The, and, and so that's a major responsibility. And, and if you decide that you don't want it, then that's fine. But if you do, then there are specific steps, and I'm sure we're going to get into, um, of how to craft your message so that hopefully it can be effective. Well, let's get into it now. How do I craft the message that is effective? That's why everyone's here. Well, one of the things that you spoke of earlier is um, with Angela is authenticity. I, I think that's incredibly important. People are going to be listening to what you have to say, um, and they're going to want guidance from you. But it has to come from someplace real, right? Or they're going to, you know, you can tell. You can tell if somebody's being genuine or not. Um, something else is I think you have to have passion for the work that you're doing. You cannot phone it in because it won't last. Just like, you know, if you're in a job that you would prefer not to have right now, you know what I mean about phoning it in. So you really have to have a passion so that you wake up, you know, Mondays are not a bad thing for you anymore because you're looking forward to the job that you get to do. And, and not a lot of people can say that. You know, I practiced law for 20 years and walked away from that and now, um, I'm having the time of my life in a second career that I never could have imagined. 
And the last thing I'll say is that you have to be incredibly knowledgeable about the position or the campaign that you're taking. People are going to come to you as an expert. I was not. I had no no connection to the entertainment industry at that at that time at all. I was just a moviegoer. So it meant that immediately I needed to know what the numbers were, the facts, the statistics, what the landscape looked like because people were coming to me with questions and wanting definitive answers. James, you're also a lawyer with a very successful career, and you decided to also start a blog. Um, I'll tell you this, as a blogger, I get a lot of interest from people who say that they want to start blogs. Everyone seems to want to start one, and very few people actually do. What made you want to start your blog? What was the catalyst? Well, <clears throat> I've been practicing law for 17 years, and it took me a long time to get to the place where I was actually I felt confident that I was successful and I felt like I had what everyone else is saying, an authentic voice, right? Um, I think, you know, th through my experience, I witnessed, you know, I, I practiced primarily entertainment law, but it was really important to me when I became, uh, when I was studying to be a lawyer, to be the best lawyer I could possibly be all the way around. So, you know, initially I started out um, like trying to mimic Johnny Cochran mm -hmm. and um, Willie Garrett. Those were two my two biggest inspirations. Right? And uh, when I came to New York, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, but when I came to New York to practice entertainment law, I uh, witnessed, um, you know, I was helping out a lot of young black men and black women achieve their dreams through entertainment. And, but in the course of, of doing so, I realized a couple of things. One, um, you know, it was important, you know, for those people to protect their brands and, and build their brands. <clears throat> and through protection of brands, I mean, like, you know, um, trademarking their name, um, uh, doing all the traditional things, copywriting their music, figuring out what their ownership was in their music, um, and, and actually protecting it so that it became an asset for them that they could monetize. So I'm saying all of that to say, I also did, you know, a lot of criminal cases. And I saw a stark contrast um, of, you know, young people with opportunities and then young people who just made poor decisions and found themselves uh, through some, you know, unfortunate circumstances being charged with a crime. So those two worlds that, I, that I've been, you know, a part of, whether it be the entertainment space where, you know, people are achieving massive success or the criminal space where people are, are you know, finding themselves possibly doing time, life, or whatever it is, um, they, I, I found a voice in between those two spaces. And I felt like it was important for people to understand uh, what what the, what you know what what the law actually meant? How it can protect you, and, and you can use it to your advantage if you build your business and you protect your brand, and how if you make missteps, you can also have you know uh, uh, very you know tragic results, right? So um, through that, you know, the, the Gotham City ESQ, which is uh, my my blog, is the the focus is we take um, today's headlines in pop culture news, mm -hmm. and we explain what the legal consequences can be, right? From whether it's you know someone you know um, going through a divorce, or whether it's somebody who is charged with a crime, or whether it's someone who had, did a big business deal, we explore it from a legal perspective. Awesome. So I was going to say something about Kevin Hart, but I'm going to move on real quick. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's conference. not going anywhere. We might as well move on. I mean, I just, yeah, OK. So, so Chris. Chris, <laughs> how did you find, how did, what made you want to start a blog? What made you, you know, like, I have a voice, I have something to share, I have people to listen, people are interested. Um, how did you do it? Um, it's always an app. App, is an app. <laughs> so I'm gonna pull it together real quick. <laughs> okay, what made you want to start an app? So, uh, so, the Scholarly is kind of born out of my own frustration of finding um, scholarships, um, you know, for college. So um, I originally, I'm originally from Alabama, and I won um, over a million dollars in scholarships myself after taking like eight months. No, it's wait, huh? Oh. <laughs> Back real quick. Did you say you won a million dollars in scholarships? Like it was like, oh, you know, I found a hundred dollars in the street. Like no, like like so. Go back. So how did you get a million dollars in scholarships? So um, I found them and applied for like several hundred of them, and then I got a lot. Of them. You applied for several hundred scholarships, right. and you got a, a, a lot of them and over a million.
I think James and I are gonna get together and package that as a new game show. Yeah, Who wants to win a scholarship? The million dollar prize? I feel like Chris might need a whole separate panel about how to get scholarship money. Like, so next year, so now we know. You know, so it was so when I came to college, um, I start I started to see that you know this problem was obviously affecting a lot of people across the nation, um, and I decided to that the hardest part about getting the money was finding it. So we really had so I really created an algorithm that instantly um, finds money for you. So it takes all the money looking for the students and the students with their money and bring them together. So it turns all the money to me to find and apply that money to like two minutes. So um, so to that point. We, um, you know, we aired on, we, so we actually, we were, so while we aren't out, we actually were able to leverage the press a lot. So actually, um, two years ago, we appeared on Shark Tank. Um, that was kind of my first time actually taking, to your point, like a, a really big platform and dealing with that. So not like an Oscar so white kind of phenomenon, but we actually started the biggest fight in Shark Tank history. And I was in college, I had taken five class, and I had a rather watch party. And I had um, a group of developers, um, you know, kind of what I was thinking, and we were getting 9,000 hits to our site per second. Um, because of this big controversial episode. So, um, so you're probably dealing with that, and uh, you know, prepared, and we have press from New York Times, um, Forbes, like all these different outlets, um, you know, talk about us. It was so, we were trending on social media, um, and you know, we're not Apple up to number one in the app store for both iPhone and Android, and so, you, so while Scali is a media company, we've been able to leverage that to be able to create a platform to um, be able to do that. So now we have two million users, and we now and we leverage that um, to not only really help those people find money for college, we also um, you know to also communicate messages about reducing debt. Actually, tomorrow we're launching a scholarship to actually help you pay back your student loans. So it's like like you have scholarships to pay. Yeah. Off. So, um, so and wait, hold on. This payback is all on the app. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's everybody in here to download that app. Everybody got Sally May. Everybody in here to download that app. So it'll be a scholarship where you can actually, so if you graduated college and you took out a loan, you can actually use it. You can win and use it to pay back the loan. So it's not paying for college. So um, it addresses that issue. And and so and so to that point of, um, of the cause of helping people get from college, we were able to, we do a lot of influence on marketing. So um, Jesse Williams and Greg Knapp is also on the college team. So we were able to, um, he wanted to really use his platform as, you know, for all the activism for Black Lives Matter, but also education, because he's a former teacher. Um, and he experienced, you know, he experienced, you know, the inequities of education. So we, so he um, joined the team, and we are constantly using his platform to get our message out. So he and I did a big video um, a year ago, and it actually got two million views, and, um, you know, it really resonated with a lot of people. So I understand the importance of media. Um, so if you are not, you know, have media companies, uh, it's important to understand how to leverage certain media outlets and influence and celebrities and things like that to be able to get your message across because it makes your message authentic, but also um, you, can you can easily reach a lot of, you can easily reach a lot of people because you know certain things go viral for a moment, but you have to find ways to sustain that growth, right? You know, I mean, people, they're like one hit wonders in TV shows, they're also one hit wonders in, you know, when, when it comes to things that are viral, right? So you have to really think about and be prepared to take advantage of those moments so you can sustain it and actually build a, a sustainable business or brand behind it. Okay, thank you. Um, quick question, how many people in here on Instagram? Okay, like the whole room. Facebook? The whole room. Twitter? Okay, so Cheryl, we were in the office last week. I stopped by Nielsen's office, and you have a great report about the state of black women coming out from Nielsen today. Today? Today, this morning. You had the, yes, okay, awesome. It, they're waving it in the back. I love it. <laughs> um, and it has really important information about the stats about black users of social media. Can you tell me a bit about those numbers? I sure can. First of all, I just want to say I'm thrilled to be up here because I'm the geek that measures all of you people, right? <laughs> and so actually seeing you, oh my God, hashtag Oscar so white, we're glad that she's here. But we've been talking about the phenomenal success of that campaign because Nielsen measures it. And for those of you who may not know who Nielsen is, we measure what consumers watch, what consumers buy, what they listen to, and now where they're tweeting, how they're Facebooking, et cetera. We measure all of it. And we did release a report today, yay. And uh, it's called African American Women, Our Science, Her Magic. And what we're really doing a deep dive on is how black women 
are using the power that we have that we don't necessarily recognize, right? That we have all of this power. And I think the really important point to make here is looking at all of our panelists today, you can't get here in this seat without followers. You can't get here in this seat without people downloading your app. Those people are you guys. So everyday consumers are really, really incredibly powerful. And we don't think about what that looks like when we're all collectively doing the same thing. So collectively, how many uh, followers did you have on, and you, you gave the numbers? When yeah. 8,000, but over a six week period, oh, you that, said? The, the, number of, the number of times Officer White was here was 600,000 in five weeks. Okay, so somebody was doing that, and that somebody is you. And so what we wanted to do from a Nielsen perspective is to give information out that talks about the actual <clears throat> power of the choices that you make when it comes to media. And we really need you to think about that power when you're deciding who you're going to follow, where you're deciding which hashtags you're going to um, continue. And so you wanted to know who's doing what. So if it comes to social media, particularly for black women 18 plus, Facebook, 72% of uh, black women are on Facebook. That is actually 10% under what total women are. But in every other category, we are like totally rocking. So YouTube, we've got 69% of black women on YouTube, 51% of black women on Instagram, Pinterest, 30%, Twitter, 24%, Google, 100, I'm sorry, 16%, and LinkedIn, 12%. And so those numbers may sound small, but they're higher than total market women. And that's what you need to keep in mind. That's what advertisers keep in mind because we as black women are totally dominating social media space. We over index, which means we go above and beyond by 86% on five hours or more on social media a day, a day. <laughs> Right? Wait. We watch a day, five Wait. hours or more. When is there time to do anything else? Yeah, that well, that we're, finding a good time. A bad. <laughs> we're finding time because not only are we doing that, we're also listening to the radio for 14 plus hours a week, which is the highest <laughs> medium that we're spending our time on. Surprise, surprise. Angela would be happy to hear that. Yes, <laughs> yes she would have. And, um, and television. We're watching 56 plus hours of television a week. So we're voracious consumers of all mediums. Now you can say that's good, you can say that's bad, it depends on which seat you're sitting in because these people would think it's good because clearly you're spending your time in their you know, neighborhoods. Cheryl, if you could just talk, we got into this really great conversation in the office, um, and I hope it's okay to share publicly, um, about how, what those numbers really mean. Because you can, you can say, you know, you're, you're, you're watching this amount of television and you're watching XYZ amount of shows or these certain shows, but we talked about it as everything that you consume is a vote for that brand. Absolutely. So you can go into that a little bit more? Yeah, so what I like to talk about is every single choice you make, and I know you guys, we make hundreds of choices every single day and we don't even think about it. We plop down on the couch and we decide, you know, I'm just gonna watch this show, right? Without necessarily thinking that the producers who make this show want you to watch it. And their livelihood is dependent upon how many of you make that decision when you plop down on the couch to watch the show. Because advertisers are advertising on that particular show. And the advertisers want to know, if you watch this show, well, did you go out and did you buy that toilet paper where you saw the bears wiping their butts? Did that re resonate with you? All of those decisions actually have impact. And somebody behind the scenes is benefiting from the decisions that you're making. And blacks are spending $1.2 trillion a year, $1.2 trillion a year on all of the decisions and choices that we're making. So we want to make sure that we're choosing very carefully. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. And for cause the rest of the panel, you're all content creators. And social media has been a huge part of your success. And I'd like to know, what are your, I say top two from each of you, your top two tips for building your brand on social media? You can go right down the line, start with um, you, John. I'll start, um, I think being yourself is uh, foremost. For me, 
Um, that's how I've been able to um, uh, really build recognition. Um, uh, I'm still a fairly young guy, but um, when I was first on social media, we was on Black Planet, you know? And so how many Black Planet users are in here? Did we, did we got fly, got on MySpace, and, um, and you know, um, so, I mean, but everything that's been happening now has been wonderful brand extension. When I started in the business, you know, I've never, I mean, outside of living down in Norfolk, Virginia, because I went to Norfolk State, um, I never moved to work in the entertainment business. I, I, I kept a hub here in D.C. And people said you could never, uh, you could never do national talk shows. You can never be an entertainment reporter on cable news. You can never cover Hollywood and the music industry from D.C. But I did because the internet created an industry without walls for me. And so while I'm always on an airplane, I'll be on one in the morning. I'm always living in a hotel. Um, you know, social media has expanded what the internet originally did by erasing the walls of the industry. Um, so um, being yourself has worked for me, um, and. Um, you know what, I, I, for me, that's just the most important thing. If you can be yourself and, and, and be totally authentic on social media, I think it'll take you further than any other, any other thing. Thank you. Authenticity, I, I, we're hearing that a lot, so I'm gonna, because he took mine, I'm gonna choose another <laughs> two. Um, I would say be consistent. So, uh, you know, a lot of us have full-time jobs, nine to fives, 10 to six, whatever that may be, and so you may not have the number of hours to spend on social media that some folks do, but if you're trying to build a brand, you want people to know when they can check in with you. So even if you say, you know what, every Wednesday from two to four, and every Sunday from five to seven, that's when you're going to find me, that's when you're going to be able to interact with me, then people will wait for you. You know, so that at least they know that specifically during that time you're gonna be right there. Uh, the other thing I would say is to be intentional. Um, about building your brand or increasing your following or whatever it means that whatever it is that you want to do because as we say the internet is forever so you have to really think about those things that you want to say I mean you look at Donald Trump's I said I was gonna say his name I'm breathe, girl, breathe, just breathe. Um, but if you, you look at his his Twitter feed you look at what he's saying now and what he's doing and for everything that is happening with respect to the administration now, you go back five years, three years, there is a tweet that he made about President Obama that's almost 180 degree opposite than where he is right now, right? And, and so because the internet is forever, people are going to search and see what you said. And you know, once you get you know, up there and you've got a significant platform, at some point, somebody's gonna come for you on the Summer Jam screen, and you're gonna be up there, and you want whatever that thing is that you said you know, when you were 20 or 25 or didn't understand intersectionality or whatever the issue is, to be relatively minimal <laughs> so that you can get through it and, tr and tweet through it or, you know, or deal with that issue until it subsides and somebody else is up there on the Summer Jam screen. So be intentional, be consistent with your with your interaction online. Thank you. I think, um, you know, the, the, the first two points they were, were excellent, and they were actually were my points as well. So, but I think that <clears throat> to add to that, the, the, the most important thing that I would think that you should, that I think you should do is just be fearless. Because in order to find your authentic voice, and in order to be consistent, you have to, it's trial and error. So a lot of times you're, you're writing things and you're saying things that are, that are authentic to you, um, but you know, they may not resonate with people. So you know, maybe you, you, but you keep going and keep trying you know, until you find something or, or say something or do something online that is gonna find that audience. Um, and it's, and you, know, you have to consistently keep trying and just keep going and be fearless about it. You know, to your point, um, if in fact, you know, um, if your brand is controversial and you want to talk about controversial things or have an, a voice on that, then you've got to, you know, uh, talk about everything that's, you know, be controversial out there and be ready to argue and fight and, and go back and forth with people. And if that's your thing, that's cool. But you know, if you if you if you one day you're controversial and the next day you're you know telling everybody to love each other and be happy, it's inconsistent. So um, it's inconsistent with your brand. So you know, stay focused. Know know who you are. Identify who you're going to be or who your brand, what your brand personality is going to be, and then from there consistently keep churning it until you find your audience. Cool. Um, and for me, I would say two things. First thing is um, be relatable. 
a lot of the content that goes viral are something that people relate to, whether it's funny, you know, um, like Scully, people need to pay for college, <laughs> right? So you think of things um, that, that's really relatable to, to people. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, Oscar So White, it went, it went, it was during a time where all, you know, where a lot of black people were outraged, right? So, um, so after, this should be relatable, it segues to my next one, being relevant. So, I mean, being relevant at a time where, um, so we actually took off, we had a lot of press white when um, everyone was talking, about, the entire news cycle was all about rising college costs, kids can't pay for college, um, you know, a year and a half ago, they're still doing it, but it was actually at a really heavy time in that period. So being relevant and in the moment and knowing what's going on in the world, and what people are outraged about, what people are excited about, you know, um, you know, that really helps. Black Lives Matter came, came about during a time where a lot of black men were getting shot. It went viral, it became a movement during a time where it was relevant, right? So, um, and thing with Oscar, same thing with so many other issues in our community. If you, if you stay relevant and understand what's going on, I'm being, I guess to that point, being intentional about what you post and the content you create, you know, it goes on, you know, you can really create those moments that, um, you know, that build, that build your brand. Thank you. Um, social media, as I think we can all agree, is a blessing and a curse. It can be great to amplify uh, your conversation, your content, your brand, but sometimes people don't like everything that you put out. And um, how do you deal with the backlash? <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, I think it was 2010. Um, I got caught in a social media uh, scandal. Don't Google it. Um, but I made a joke on Twitter that was not received by the natural hair community. And it became a thing. I didn't realize that the real N-word is nappy and not the one that we don't like the other people to use. And so it was a thing. You, you, you Like everybody else, you go through it, you apologize. It is what it is. Um, but what it did was it, 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 it helped create an, uh, an exceptional level of compassion in me for sound bites, because like with most things uh, that end up in the media, uh, and we saw it with Shirley Sherrod, we saw it with Roland Martin in the Super Bowl. Um, it, when you take something out of the context of the conversation that it's taken in, and you just harp on one part of it, it can become something else. And so now when people come to me and they say, "Oh, did you see what such and such said?" Because everybody gets their news from reading. Um, uh, Instagram and Facebook headlines instead of reading the meat of an article, I always say, well, what was the context of that thing? Because when you look at the context of a situation, um, it, it changes it. So that, that's the curse of it for me. Uh, the gift of it for me was um, in 2015, when we were going into, no, actually, I'm sorry, two, early 2016, when we were going into the heat of the political season, one of the, the, the challenges being um, an entertainment TV host and correspondent is that in political seasons, the work dries up for us. And so it's all politics all the time. And so there were no talk show bookings. Uh, there was no cable news bookings. They're just, I wasn't cashing any SAG after checks, nor was I getting any residuals. And so I, I still had a voice. I had things that I wanted to say, nor did I, I want my, my, my gift to get um, dull. I wanted to keep my instrument strong and sharp. And so everybody was on Facebook Live talking about this is me in the grocery store buying box of cereal, well I decided to do a weekly Facebook Live and format it like a talk show. And I would go into it and I would do hot topics and I would talk about the things that was going on. I'd talk about the places that I bet uh, had just you know gone and were going and all of that stuff. And while people were entertained thinking it was just another Facebook Live, for me, it was just me rehearsing what I'm going to do on television when the right network wakes up and decides this is what he needs to be doing on television. And so that's how you use social media to work for you, keep yourself sharp. It's not always about the frivolous and uh, uh, not always showing that you just got your new Louis Vuitton purse and your red bottom shoes, but you can use it to sharpen your skill and also expand your voice. Thank you. April, can you elaborate? I mean, for hours. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, once you gain a platform, and it's not really all about the numbers. I said, you know, when I started Oscar to White two and a half years ago, I had 8,000 followers. Now I have over 100,000. And to paraphrase Biggie, more followers, more problems. Like, they're just going to come. So every single day, every single day, I wake up and I check my Twitter feed, my mentions, um, people who have said something to me. There's something negative. Every day. 
without, without fail. And then there are those who are so negative and yet still cowardly that they don't want anybody else to see what they said. So now they send you a private message calling you a racist, ignorant, B, C, you name them, you know, you name the letter. Um, and so I like to say that I deal with it with style and grace, right? And which for me means there are times when I will reclaim my time, as Auntie Maxine says, yes. and drag you for filth and leave nothing left, right? And, and, that, and that will be, and that is my entertainment. And I do it in a way, but, but, Sometimes I do it just for me because I feel like it, but, some, but more often than not, I'm doing it as education for the folks who are following me, right? You need to know who the racists are in this world and what they're really thinking about us. So let me highlight this fool for you, right? And then tear him down and leave him for dead. Um, but, you all, but you also need to understand that this is the psyche that we're dealing with. You know, this is what, the other side, what, and regardless, you know, we can talk politics or anything else, what the other side is feeling, how are we going to handle that as a community? That, you know, so I try to take the trolls that, we, that I get and deal with it that way. And the, and the other thing I will say is you kill them with facts every time. So I did Oscar So White, and, and I had a whole bunch of racists say to me, oh, well, you know, you want more black people in movies, that's just a quota system, or what about BET, BET so black? And I'm like, well, don't you remember that Sam Smith won, as a white man, won Best New Artist at the BET Awards? So let's talk about that, you know, and, or NBA so black. And so if you can deal with the issues that are important to you with facts, you shut them all the way down because I don't get emotional. I do not give strangers my emotional energy. I save that for my family and friends. So there is nothing that you can say or call me on any social media platform that's going to affect me, but I will let you know that you're not gonna try somebody else the way you tried me. Try Jesus, not me. All right. James, I have a different question for you. In, in April, that was a great setup. Um, in this era of fake news and alternative facts, you are a man who's, who's giving advice or, or breaking down legal concepts, what's legal, what's not, how that proceeds. And unfortunately, as we know, a lot of people don't necessarily, they're in a problem, they don't turn to an attorney, they don't turn to a doctor, they try to diagnose themselves online. I'd like to know what responsibility do you feel um, to deliver correct information? I know that's a weird question, but you gotta ask in fake news and alternative facts world. What responsibility do you do you have to deliver accurate, responsible, and informed content? Because it's social media, or not social media, but it's the internet, and everybody does it. You know, it's, um, that's a really good question because um, it's super important, specifically because our site is, like you said, it's, it's about the law. Um, it's super important to, to be accurate, as accurate as possible. Now, the law it changes all the time, and then you've got different jurisdictions where certain laws apply that, that, that may not apply in other jurisdictions. So we, um, you know, prior to posting, uh, it, it's a challenge because you, you know, you've got to be timely with your information, but at the same time, you've got to vet it out to make sure you're not giving inaccurate information. And people, you know, like, like I think has been mentioned, they want to find fault in what you have to say, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, a lot of times we tell them what the law is and a certain, or, or, or how it applies to a certain set of facts, um, whether it be, you know, um, you know, like you said, the Kevin Hart situation, you know, with extortion. What does extortion mean, right? We talk through it and um, we, you know, try to, and we, you know, give an accurate description of what it means in this, in, in, in a certain state, wherever the, the, the you know, the crime is allegedly taking place, or if it's federal law, whatever the federal law says. Um, or if it's, you know, Usher, the Usher herpes situation. And, you know, it's, you know, what does that mean? You went all the way there. Yeah, I, I'm going there, we go there, so. But, it, but, but the law, there's a legal, uh, uh, it has a, there's a perspective that the law, um, you know, that, that, that we could talk about that the law addresses. And so yes, we do try to be as accurate as possible. We just we just tell it tell you know tell you what the what the law says, and then a lot of times we have people who debate in the comments, mm -hmm. right? And they say, well, you know, he you know whatever perspective you want to take on it, um, but they debate it out, and we encourage that actually. So um, because it 
you know, we want to be that place where you can sit back and everybody can argue and, you know, take a position. And, and it's great for hits and numbers. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, the brands love it. Carry on. <laughs> um, just because you mentioned Usher and then Kevin Hart. So if Aniko left, you know, I'll ask afterward. I'll ask afterward. <laughs> she's not leaving. <laughs> she's no, she's not. Not, we'll get to that. We'll okay. talk about that after. You can just hit me afterward because I'm obsessed with this Kevin Hart thing right now. Um, Chris, I have an actual serious question for you about like making money because you're so good at this. <laughs> and tech. And you're good at tech. Um, people know about apps. People know they exist. We all have them on our phones. But how does one get into that space? Like, what is the first step for creating an app? Like, how did you do this? Um, you know, so, I mean, the first thing you really want to do is that you, you have your idea. You want to have your idea. And something that has really replaced traditional business plans for, for tech companies are these things we call pitch decks, where you um, put together these probably 15 to 20 um, person PowerPoint decks that kind of visualizes your concept. So you have someone who's a designer or someone who, um, you know, who's good art, they can actually design that for you. Because what happens is a lot of people approach a lot of, you know, app development pr pretty backwards where they go and find developers or idea they haven't even fleshed out and they end up wasting everyone's time and their money, quite frankly. So um, I suggest, you know, really putting, really kind of putting, putting, putting your ideas on paper and whatever, whatever way you can to help visualize your idea and your concept, your problem, how the app will work and steps by steps how to do that. Because developers are great people, they're very talented, but they're talented at development <laughs> projects. So if you try to try to come up with some idea that's conceptual in your head, it, you know, it, you'll spend a lot of time reiterating that. I think that um, you know, so I mean, you so you really want to be able to team that audience what you need because I mean, you are building an app, but you have to really figure out how to get it out there. So you really want to figure out what your brand is and how you're going to get it, you know, and, and what your um, and what your PR, you know, what your strategy is going to be to get users. Because a lot of apps, there are millions of apps. Probably more than that in the app store, but you know they a lot of them they have no visibility, they have no user base kind of out there. So if you're not even thinking about your go to market strategy, you know after you build this out, after you have this concept, um, after you build a team around it, you know you're you're ultimately wasting everyone's time. And I can I used to work in venture capital for a few years, so I've seen plenty of people spend hundreds of thousand dollars on product launch and they completely fail. You know, um, so it's a so it's a so it's really really important that you come up with your idea, visualize your idea. You know, in some way on paper, and they are able to effectively articulate that to developers, uh, or find a team that you know can help uh, you know, put that together, and then think about your you know, how to get that um, how to get that product um, how to get that product to market, and then um, and then and then think about that. So that that would be my answer. Thank you, James, and also April, because you're also an attorney. You know, this panel is about owning your content and owning your your company and your brand. What are a few quick steps that we can take? So like, you know, if we're gonna start a website, I'm gonna come up with a name for it, I'm gonna buy the URL, like, does that mean I own it? Like, what, what, how does that work? <laughs> well, <clears throat> you should take the extra step of, of trademarking your name. And what you, what you would hate to do is build an audience, not, you know, you build an audience uh, for a name that you don't own. And then somebody comes in and takes your name. Um, and they, you know, they trademark it and they, they're able to monetize it and then you have to switch it up. That would be terrible, right? Um, so uh, trademarking your name is the first thing that you should do uh, before, or you should, you know, clearly you want to get your URL, but you also want to make sure that that name is available. Um, you know, and like, like I think Chris was just saying that you want to make sure that you are poised for success in the long run. Um, and you can't be poised for success in the long run if you don't own your name. I, I'll just piggyback on that. It, um, intellectual property is incredibly important, and I don't think enough content creators take advantage or even know which questions to ask. So there is an education piece that we need to talk about and really figure out. So in addition to trademark, there's also copyright. So you start a blog. You don't want somebody taking your stuff and putting it somewhere else or you know, doing a Melania and just saying that they wrote it instead of you. So you have to ensure that, I, I, I'm gonna speak my mind because we in this room with us. So you have to ensure that you're protecting your product from the very beginning. And, and you know, there, once you write something and you use it, it's basically yours. But you have to ensure that you're protecting it so that no one else comes for your stuff because it's, it's not worth it and you end up losing 
your time and your, your capital that you've expended, you know, the resources that you've expended to create it. So those are the things that I would say that you need to talk to an intellectual property attorney once you decide that this is what you're gonna do. And it's worth it to spend the money to do so up front than to try and circle back, right, or recover it, or then you have to challenge somebody and they say, oh, well, did you protect it? No, and so then you're sort of out of luck. And there are resources for you out there. I mean, not everybody has you know, $10,000 that they can just go in for initial consultation, but you can speak with law students, you can go, you know, there are, in Maryland, there's Maryland Volunteer Legal Services, so there are folks out there that you can speak to for much less money about the really important questions. But as a content creator, and that means blogs, that means if you're creating t-shirts, artwork, if you're making a web series, whatever it is that you're doing that you want someone else to consume, whether it is free or not, you need to have those conversations about protecting what it is that you've created. John, what steps have you taken to protect Always A-List and, and also the content on Always A-List? Because I know one of the things that I would find when I was like in my heavy blogging days is I would write something and then someone else would write something very similar or they might take all my words and then not quote me and not attribute and not like link back. And then it, that was a problem. That was a problem that got ugly sometimes. But how do you protect your work? When, when I launched my uh, website, I, uh, I used the entertainment attorney that went through and went through all the legal rigmarole to make sure I was doing everything proper so that we wouldn't have any issues. Uh, and also setting up my business infrastructure so that uh, even though I'm a very celebrity friendly, brand friendly entity, if somebody decided to arbitrarily sue me, that they'd be able to sue the infrastructure and not me as a person. Awesome, smart, smart. And Cheryl, I just had a quick question. You mentioned that there were certain shows that black women watch on a regular basis. I just want to know what those were to make sure we're voting with our dollars correctly. The top 10 shows? Top 10 shows, if you have them for me. I have them right here. Empire's number one. <laughs> the New Edition Story was number two. Star on Fox, number three. <laughs> Haves and have nots. Oh, my mama watches that awful show. Yeah. <laughs> mother mama watches that show. Worst acting on television. But it came in fourth place, so <laughs> sisters like it. Oh, and speaking of the worst acting on television, read the next one. Love and Hip Hop Atlanta. Oh. There you go. We've got to have a community meeting about that one. We've got to upgrade our TV watch. But hang on, because it pops up again. So Scandal is sixth place. Yes. Queen Sugar. Is seven. How, to, How get to get away with murder, murder. is yes. eight. Love and hip hop seven. We, we definitely call them. Is them. back on again. So pop up twice. Can we get a Yonla so to love, deal with our love and hip hop love issue? Love and hip hop six season and love and hip hop seven. So I guess they do. Um, Fix it, Jesus. The, wow. Yeah. Fix so we not Jesus. only watch them when they are live and current, but we watch the reruns as well. A rerun of Ratchet. We already know what's happening. Okay. And right. well, right. you may have missed some of that season. They should miss the entire season. So, John. <laughs> and then the, uh, the tenth show that black women are watching is If Loving You Is Wrong. Interesting. Now what's interesting is that 40% of the top 10 are actually shown on networks that really focus on African Americans. But the other 60% are not. However, what you have in common is the fact that there are black leads or primarily all black cats. Interesting. Now that doesn't surprise me at all because like me and my mother both do this. Like we're like bored and you're just watching TV. You just flip and flip and flip until you see the black people. And my, yeah. Not, so yeah. And that's why content is so important. And that's why I tell people who have Nielsen boxes in their home, first of all, if you don't have a Nielsen box, your home is not being measured. The houses that have the boxes represent X, Y, Z number of other households. But what I like people to understand is if you go home and you plop down on the couch and you and your mom just da da da, let's say you are a Nielsen household, the box doesn't ask you, so now are y'all just bored and watching this because you're bored? It just knows that you're watching it. So it doesn't discriminate on whether or not you're doing it just because you like watching train wrecks or you know, you're just doing it because you want to talk about it on your blog. It just knows that you're watching it. 
and that's what we capture. So it's really important, again, for you to decide and make choices on what you're going to watch. And a lot of black women are still watching reality TV, even though I ask when I'm in a room like this, how many of you all have tried to pull the weave out of some other woman's head? Show of hands. Two, and I always get people who say, yes, they have. I see two hands that went up. And then they usually were you say. Un were you under the age of 18 when you did it? But usually they say they have a really grown good reason. Because women are doing that, that's, a, that's part of the reason why we need to call a community meeting about those two shows. Well, the next question is, how many of you all have actually thrown a drink in another person's face? Same the same two. Another, another <laughs> you know, she's like, okay, don't be calling and do me either out. Either one of you want to be on the next episode of Iyanla Fix My Life? There's some issues here. So there you have it. There is an audience for everything. For everything. Well, Not that there should be. No, no, that's factual and actual. The fact that black women are consuming love and hip hop in such extreme numbers is problematic for our community. Woo! It really is. It really is. So I mean, what I always I mean, people like got mad say, when Mona Scott was going to do sorority sisters because they hit too close to home for people. Yeah. But the reason why she was able to green light a sorority sisters is because Love and Hip Hop has 18 franchises. Right. 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 And VH1 has structured a whole programming of ratchetness right. based off the fact that black women are watching these two god awful yeah. shows yeah. Right. where they're the lowest paid reality TV show. Like you're watching, they're the number two shows in the top 10 in Nielsen. But do you know that they only are making like five hundred to twelve hundred dollars an episode? So the reason why they're coming to your city and having to host all these ratchet club and strip club appearances is because they're not making any money for pulling hair, pouring drinks, and all the advertisers and all the executives are making all the money. Absolutely. While these washed up hip hop stars and these ratchet video girl chicks are embarrassing us, setting us back, and white people think that's how we act when you sit next to them in a the first class plane. Every time I sit on the plane next to somebody, am I a rapper? No, I've never rapped. But I don't rap. But tell us how you really feel. Rapper Murray and the rest There's of the panel. White TV too. I'm gonna hold but, on. But 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 here Cheryl, is the point. One second because I'm running out of time. Okay. But it still doesn't just so, two wrongs don't make it right, we're my not, sister. But John here's the and point. Cheryl, John, here's the point. The point Cheryl. is when we have quality TV to watch and we show up in numbers to watch that. So a lot of folks said Queen Sugar. So when you start seeing quality, when you have better choices, you make better choices. But when you don't have anything to choose from, you're watching what's on. I don't necessarily watch these things, but when we don't have anything to choose from, which is why I like to think of what Chandra Rhymes has done, it's kind of like the Bible, you know, where Abraham begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so, that's what Chandra did. So she begat uh, Grey's Anatomy, which begat private practice, which begat scandal, which begat how to get away with murder. And all of that begatting was going on on one network, and so the other network say, ooh, we need some of this too. But in 2017, there's a lot of options out here. There are a lot and of options out there, but the that dollars, the dollars, and, and, and the point that I want to make is showing the, up. The, the okay. dollars John, is scary John, because John, what we're showing John, advertisers John is, Sir Murray, can I make this I, last point? The no, dollars is scary because what we're John, showing advertisers John. I have to open it up to oh, the floor. Sure. I'm, getting, I'm getting signals. Okay, we have questions. There are questions from the audience. We are, are very engaged and very involved. We have about 20 minutes or so. Yes, ma'am. Doc, don't yell at me Thank again, you. all right? All right, cool. Calm down and talk to me afterwards if you have a problem. Okay, gentlemen, right. gentlemen. We're about to go love and hip hop in a minute if you don't calm moment. down. We're gonna, we gonna play nice today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you question. all for your insight. Thank you so very much for your insight. But I definitely want to ask the question about the Nielsen. I've been living, and I've always heard about these magical Nielsen boxes. Oh, good. Okay. Please explain the data collection process yes. for not just the television, but I don't know anybody in my circle in the world that owns a Nielsen box. I've, I've heard that all the time. Like, I then don't the know anybody is, who's ever been a Nielsen household. Right. That's your question? Yep. Yeah, that question, and then also the data collection process for the other social media outlets. Okay, so for um, collecting what is viewed on television, we have households that are representative of all the other households. And so 
usually one household represents about a thousand other households, which is, from a sampling perspective, very accurate. It's the way when you look at all the political polls and, and we believe what's happening in politics, except the last election, because um, people lied, but when you look at the political polls, there are also about the same type of representation from a sample. One of the reasons you may not know anyone who's been a Nielsen home is because we ask you to sign a confidentiality agreement while you are a Nielsen home, because we don't want local stations reaching out to you once they find out that you're a Nielsen home and say, hey, we'll make it worth your while if you just watch our station or our network. So that could be one of the reasons. You cannot volunteer to be a Nielsen television household, but some of the other information that we do measure, you can go to Nielsen.com um, for like social media, et cetera, and we do allow a volunteer for that. Thank you. Yes, sir. To the gentleman, I apologize to you. Thank you. You're Thank right? you. And I apologize to you. We don't need that. And we Absolutely. accept the love. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's one thing I've noticed about the panel. The discussion was not was all over the internet and media and social media. But there was one media that was not discussed very thoroughly, and that is, com that is the cable industry mm -hmm. and how we can get involved in the cable industry. We don't have a lot of folks involved in the cable industry. I'm here, I'm John Marks, former mayor of the city of Tallahassee, um, college professor at Florida and in the School of Journalism and the Graphic Communications, and I'm now vice president for uh, affiliate relations for Black Television News Channel. The Black Te Television News Channel is worldwide, seven, not, seven days a week, 24-hour channel, scheduled to launch next summer. Our focus is completely completely and directly on news, information, and education. No entertainment, unless the entertainment happens to be news, newsworthy. Then we will focus on that. And what's the question? Well, the question is, do we need that? Do we need that? News? news. Black news? Black. Coverage? A worldwide television network focusing on bringing news from an African-American perspective, such as CNN, or well, a perspective, a perspective, such as Fox, CNN, Al Jazeera, uh, Telemundo, those, do we need something like that in our communities? If I, could, oh, 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 if I could take that one, um, I would absolutely say yes. I mean, I think everybody in here grew up on BET News with Jackie yeah. Reed. Yeah. Like, we still wait for Jackie to come back one day. Like, <laughs> like you, you, need, you need that perspective. You absolutely need a perspective. You know, you got the, the liberal, the, uh, the quote unquote liberal perspective of the left, and you got the conservative perspective that is running wild. Um, but you absolutely need a, a credible, reliable, central news source um, from the point of view of African Americans. I think we do a great job of inserting our opinion in social media. Um, also YouTube, that's something that we didn't delve into here. But, um, and I think Simone and Angela and Janae and all of the other, Joy Reid, my father loves her, he would kill me if I didn't mention her, are doing a great job holding down in the network. But to have a centralized source of black news would be awesome. So I absolutely wish you the best. Tell me how I can support. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question, um, I'm the spokesperson for Let's Buy Black 365, yeah. and uh, we have a group of uh, mainly millennials who are working on a black media project to create more positive uh, content, uh, news, lifestyle, entertainment. Uh, and the question is, well, two-part question. One, for Cheryl. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm just the, the research person in yeah. the job. Okay, go on. Um, so one, how do we um, connect, or how do we distill uh, the information from, uh, I'm sorry, let me phrase it this way. What I seem to hear, when, especially when you talk about flipping through the channels, is what people do when they're in the desert and they're starving mm -hmm. and they're thirsty, mm -hmm. is we will do the most ignorant-based things for survival, almost. Um, how do we different we do in that context? Despite my feelings about some of the content presented <laughs> on TV, um, we're still in a supply and a demand business. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I was very concerned and alarmed by um, how high Love & Hip Hop ranked on the Nielsen ratings is because yes. what it does is it shows 
um, the white cons uh, advertisers and buyers in the business, that that's what we as a people, that's where they should spend their money. And so they want to duplicate that effort and, and, and instead of investing in uh, a black news channel or <coughs> investing in quality substance oriented program that you're speaking of, they would rather somebody duplicate what the Love and Hip Hop franchise does because it shows us where black dollars should be spent. And so unfortunately, I think there are limited resources for the good and the quality programming because of the fact that our consumer palette is a little bit scattered in how <laughs> we consume things. And I think we've got to make sure that we encourage our neighbors, our friends, and our family members to support more positive oriented television programming and the content so that the resources are there to create more of that. Yeah, because what we've seen is we've seen networks or uh, cable stations try to put on quality content. Viewers don't show up. So that's why I'm always amazed when I sit in these rooms and I hear the outrage and I see that, you know, no one's going around with the exception of two or three people per room, you know, doing the hair pulling and the drink throwing. But yet when quality Maybe content is there, <laughs> when quality content is there, we're not showing up. And we've got to show up and we've got to speak up. When my, I don't allow certain shows turn on in my house. And when I have my little 19, 32 year old nieces in the house, Oh, y'all not watching that up in here? You got a Nielsen box. We don't have a Nielsen <laughs> box. But, but let me say this, it, it goes beyond, the, it has to be a mindset. You have to set your standards higher. Set them higher. Thank you. I think it goes back uh, to directly what you said about how you vote with your consumer dollars. Everything you purchase, everything you watch, it's a vote for it. And every time you don't watch, it's a vote for something else. So. Can I also add in there, None of us in the room have a Nielsen box, or if you did, you couldn't tell us anyway. But there are ways for you to register your pleasure and your displeasure, which is using social media. Absolutely. Right? So, it, I mean, we, there are several shows that we live tweet, as a, we say, as a family, even though we're spread all across the country, but we're millions strong. And you get those hashtags trending, yeah. whatever it is, how to get away with murder, scandal, whatever the show, Queen Sugar, whatever the show is and advertisers are looking at that, right? So not everybody has Twitter, but if you think about it, every single TV show, whether it's the, a football game that's on or a serial drama, every show has a hashtag. That's intentional, because that means the advertisers, the producers, everybody is watching what we are watching, even if it doesn't rank in the top 10 or whatever on Nielsen, yeah. they're still looking to see what we're doing. I have networks reaching out to me directly saying, hey, we're going to premiere a new show this fall. We would love for you to be the person who live tweets the first episode because we know that if you bless it, then it's going to mean something to other people in the room. We all can do that. That's yes. not a follower thing. That's not a, a number follower thing. That's an engaged follower thing. Engagement. So you can have 2,000 followers or whatever your number is on Twitter or other social media, but people will still reach out to you because they know that your followers are energized and engaged. And if you say, if you give the recommendation, then it must be good. <coughs> Thank and, you. And, and networks well, actually look at cross-platform um, engagement now. So it's no longer just the ratings. It's also what you're talking about, and we measure that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first, let me say to the panel, this has been a learning experience for me. <laughs> I am not a blogger. I'm not a television watcher. And so I have gotten some very good information here today. But this Do you question, listen to the radio? Uh, I listen to uh, the 60s music. Okay. You know, I love like Jane Ryan, that kind of music. That's good music. I don't know the new singers. I don't know the scandal. I know none of that. <laughs> I choose not to know. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I do. But all of this has been very educational for me, so thank you for that. But I do want to ask James a question. I'm very interested in your legal app that you say you have. And most of you have not given any positive feedback that you get from your blog. And so I'm most certainly going to look up your legal blog because I think that that's something that I would use. But what have you, what kind of feedback have you got from a positive perspective to know that you're doing something that the public needs? And the other thing is what motivates all of you to keep going, to keep doing what hey, you're James, doing. James, if you want to take, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to ask the second, answer the second question first. 
what motivates me to keep going is the positive feedback because it relates back right. to the, the, the first person. So um, the positive feedback that I get is, you know, basically it, it helps direct us to finding the audience and speaking to that audience. So if we've got, you know, the, I think you know it was crazy because we, we, we posted um, an article uh, one time about this jazz musician mm -hmm. and he had sued um, a hip hop artist because the hip hop artist mm -hmm. actually used a portion of his record in his record and didn't credit him appropriately. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was, it, for, for me and for my writers, we just you know, wrote about it and threw it up there and told what the legal consequences were and, and kept it pushing. What we did not anticipate was that that article was going to be taken and put into um, a chat room with a bunch of other musicians and hip hop artists and they debated and debated and debated and it drove the numbers of, of, view, of, of, of likes and viewers um, to the point where we realized that we, you know, we were doing something that was helpful, helpful. to a community of people, mm -hmm. and that information was, um, you know, it was basically news that they could use, uh, which was, you know, what we tried to, you know, we uh, we tried to emulate it in return. Positive feedback, keep you going. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Right, thank Sir, you. your question. Hi, uh, name is Philip Lewis, uh, front page editor with Huffington Post. Uh, thank you so much for this panel. It's my first time being at the CBC uh, week weekend, uh, and this is one of the better uh, panels that I've, that I've been able to watch. So I learned a lot. So thanks. Uh, my question is just about uh, social media in general. Um, so there are like millions of voices online, uh, just spreading their information and their uh, opinions every day. So um, what advice would you all give to people who are trying to, uh, I guess? cut through the noise and break through the noise and, and create their own sort of like brand? What, what advice would you give to those sorts of folks looking to do that thing? John, if you could take that one. Yeah, there's a great article that I read on medium.com that I shared with like all my friends and some business associates about two weeks ago. Uh, and it really speaks to this because we're in the mindset of thinking that an audience, in order to have an audience on social media, you have to have a million followers. And that's not the case anymore. You just have to have an engaged following. That's one of the words you used a few minutes ago. Um, you, it, um, if you can build um, an audience of 3,000 people of your peers and your family members, and every time you post something on social media, you get 500 comments or 500 likes, that's an engaged audience. There are people who have 500,000 followers on social media, and they get 30 likes. The, the, the ratio of interaction is very off there. So now, there's this whole subsection of, of the media business, something that I know Demetri and I both benefit from greatly, called influencers. Um, and so we're able to subsidize our income uh, through companies that pay us to engage with people, not because we have the most massive amount of followers, but we have a very engaged base. And so I, I, I challenge everybody, and, and, the, and the article really kind of details it with like all the marketing science and stuff. Don't worry about like the masses. Worry about a core group. And if you can keep the core group engaged, sometimes the masses will then follow the core. Yes. Thank you so much. Excellent answer. And we have four minutes left, but sorry, I actually absolutely want you to have your question. Yeah, I'm not gonna put you away. Come on. Come on. Awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Thomas. Uh, I have a nonprofit organization called the Building Blocks. But we take a grassroots approach to a community and economic development um, by helping people start their own businesses. Um, the first question goes to uh, uh, my fellow Esquires. Uh, how can we bridge the gap between active content creators and influencers and, uh, in the legal and business acumen that's needed to create and expand their networks? Uh, as I'm sure you all already know, uh, you know, the clients always come to you when it's too late. So you know, how can we get them there beforehand? How can we kind of bridge that education gap where they're uh, actively seeking that information before those issues arise? And then uh, my question, I guess, is open to the panel. Uh, much like how coding uh, is emerging as an educational track for black people, how can we provide the resources for uh, our talented you know, men and women, <laughs> boys and girls, to cultivate their talents and produce quality social media content? James, if you could take the first, and Chris, if you could take the second. I, I, brother, can you come back real quick? I want to make sure I, I, I capture and answer your question. Could you ask it one more time? Ah, not a problem. Uh, how can we bridge the gap between active content creators and influencers and the legal and business acumen that they need to create and expand their brand, like on social media? So like wh whether or not they have a YouTube channel, for instance, starting a, co a corporation, mm -hmm. an LLC, a uh, partnership, you know, uh, creating the legal entities that are necessary for them to 
you know, expand their brand or protect their brand, trademark and copyright and so on and so forth? How can we get that information to them beforehand uh, as they're coming up, as they're currently creating content, so that it's not too late when these legal issues do arise in the future? Well, I think um, the best way to do that is, is, is through education, right? And I think, um, you know, a lot of times the information's out there. So if you're going to take an educated approach to your business, then you have to do what John said he did at the very beginning. And that's, you know, realize that you need to form a corporation, but you've got to figure out what entity type is best for your long-term strategy, right? Then you need to trademark or copyright your material so that it's actually owned by your corporation and you at the end of the day. And so uh, to answer your question, how do you get ahead of it? You've got to do your research. And to try and, you know, um, each person that, that's, that takes on any endeavor is tasked with doing the research on how to get to their goal uh, prior to starting. You know, a lot of times as a, as a community, you know, we, we, you know, we don't want to take, we want to, you know, cut through uh, the process and, and take shortcuts, but there are no shortcuts to success. You've got to go, you know, um, start and build a strong foundation, which again is a corporation, a former corporation, and then, um, you know, protect your content. And those who don't end up being the horror stories that you read about a lot of times, and they try to do it after the fact. But at that time, what typically happens, and I think this is the question that you were, uh, the issue that you were addressing, they're under attack, and they want someone like me to come in and try to help. And I, I'm, I'm down to do it, but you got to pay me, right? It's and cost uh, you. you know, it's a process. That's, it is what it is. Yeah, I know we're late, but can I? Thirty seconds. Very we have, we, we have to meet the people where they are. Right, so, so you can write the best 30 page legal brief or white paper, but somebody on Facebook ain't gonna read it. So you need to have a Facebook live chat where you're discussing with the creators, this is what you do. This is how you, you, know, you file with the USPTO. You need to have a Twitter live discussion. So if you're talking about content creation that's happening on YouTube, if you're talking about web series, then you need to have a primer, a tutorial on YouTube. And so you're meeting the people where they are, and that's the best way to make sure that they're getting the information they need. Sorry. Thank you. And quickly, the, the, to your second point about how do you inspire you know, the young generation, well, young, like, I'm 20. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. to, um, to put positive content, it's, it's really, and, it, well, and that's really, that's the other point, it's really into, like one working with people who already, the African Americans who already are influencers and, <coughs> and make sure they're putting out content out there, right? Um, so when you look at the, the whole debacle about love and hip hop and things like that, it was actually, I think recently Essence, um, the recent Essence Cup is actually one of the, one of the stars of I think one of the Real Housewives, one of the shows, and then when you have like people in the comments saying like, you inspire me and look up to that, th that's your inspiration. You're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna replicate that thing. Like, well, I need to produce content like that. I need to post on there. I need to get in someone's face and be shaded to do to, to become successful and be famous. So I think it's really, um, really shifting who their who their role models are because they're, I mean, people, I mean, they're gonna produce younger people are generally gonna follow these influencers and they're gonna produce content um, to to replicate um, what they're doing because they want the same success that they see other people see other people have. So. so make better consumer choices. It all comes back to you all. I keep telling you that, but you don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I would like to give a very big thank you. Please a round of applause for our panel. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your insights and your thoughts and your gifts and your inspirations with us. I greatly appreciate it. And also very much a thank you to Congresswoman Clark. She had to run out to, you know, CBC event. She's on this weekend. So thank you very much uh, for pulling this together. And thank you all for attending. Really appreciate you.